Good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Dr. Dina Ibrahim, Associate Professor of Broadcast and Electronic Communication Arts at San Francisco State University. I'll be the moderator for today's program, Women's Identity, Rethinking the Hadith. We also welcome our listening and internet audiences and invite everyone to visit us online at www.commonwealthclub.org. Now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Namath Hafiz Baranji. Baran Baran <laughs> Barazanji, excuse me. Dr. Barazanji is a research fellow at Cornell University, where she works on Muslim and Arab women's education, identity, and belief system, as well as feminist and gender studies. She's widely published, and her most recent book is Women's Identity and Rethinking the Hadith. If you'd like, there are uh, there is a handout that you can check out uh, along with uh, the book. There is a 50% discount code you can use to order the book. But if you were wondering what some of the phrases um, that Dr. Barazanji is going to use in her talk, there's a few definition of terms, and I would urge you to take uh, a look at that. Her highly reviewed book, Women's Identity and the Quran, A New Reading, was described as one of the most radical books in the last 14 centuries of Islam. She's also written Islamic Identity and the Struggle for Justice, in addition to over 50 publications, many of which have been translated into Arabic, German, and Spanish. Dr. Barazanji received her BA from Damascus University and her PhD from Cornell. Welcome, Dr. Barazanchi. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming. Can you hear me well? I think I'm going to raise it a little bit. Well, I'm honored to be invited again to the Commonwealth Club of California. My special thanks go to Celia and the Middle East Forum staff for their efforts, and to Dr. Dina Ibrahim for moderating today's presentation. I will speak for about 35 minutes, or a little less, or a few minutes more, to keep time for question and answer. I will start with the genesis of my book, and its goal, then I will go for with elaborate with some examples. The two central problems that I am addressing in my book are institutionalizing uh, the Hadith and the exclusion of women in shaping and developing Islamic thought. I analyze a Muslim's misuse of the reported narratives attributed to the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Muhammad narratives became a pivotal source of Islam when they were documented in writing centuries ago under the rubric hadith. As you can tell, hadith in Arabic means narrative. So that's the literature of hadith, means the narratives attributed to Prophet Muhammad. The objective of women's identity and rethinking the hadith is to affirm the necessity to shift the discourse of understanding and discussing Islam from being a dogmatic law into a religious, moral, rational worldview. This shift will also clarify the difference between Quranic Sharia with a capital S and what is called Islamic Sharia law with the small s, as you can see on your, the definition sheet. The hope 
with this shift is that we will change the perceived passive agency of Muslim women as secondary in the social structure of Muslim societies. It also hope in the book, I'm also hoping that we uncover the claims and behaviors of extremists and criminal Muslims to alleviate the current upheaval in these societies. Let me explain. The reported narratives attributed to Prophet Muhammad have evolved significantly affecting daily lives of Muslims, in particular affecting Muslim women enormously. Yet there has been less study of their authority despite the fact that some of their contents contradict the Quran, which is the primary source of Islam. Even though also centuries of scholarships were spent on the authentication of the trust and the trustworthiness of the narratives. Unfortunately, most Muslims, regardless of their level of education, still foil Islam in the image of their own belief that these narratives attributed to the Prophet are divine. Hence, they literally and uncritically emulate them, essentially placing hadith at the level of the Quran. Fanatic Muslims, by extension, further misuse and take these narratives as well as some Quranic verses out of their historical context to justify their criminal act and political agenda. Prophet Muhammad would be amazed and sad at such perspectives of Islam and at the general Muslims' habitual practice of Islam. The idea of this book and the research that led to it was conceived during the past 10 years while I was discussing my 2004 book, Women's Identity and the Quran, a new reading at different forums and symposium. One of these lectures was in July 2010 here at the same forum at the Commonwealth Club. I opened my lecture then titled Why Muslim Women Must Reinterpret the Quran by stating, quote, the time has come for Muslim women to move from peaceful, silent revolution that is firmly grounded in the Quran into an open struggle against injustice, end of quote. This statement is still valid today, but when I made it, I did not imagine or dream that my challenge would be acted on in less than a year. In February 2011, a young scholar activist wrote me an email saying, you, quote, your open struggle is taking place. She was referencing the first YouTube posted on the internet by the Egyptian female revolutionary Asma Mahfouz, who was calling for the first freedom demonstration in Cairo Tahrir Square. Though I'm pleased that my idea of a peaceful open struggle for justice seems to have resonated, I have no claim on the realities on the ground. But I feel pain every time I see that peaceful struggle transformed into violent chaos. Furthermore, as I was writing the first draft of this new book in early, I'm sorry, in late 2010 and early 2011, I could not help but note how most scholars, politicians, and media outlets were surprised at the active participation of Arab and Muslim women in what's going to be the Arab Spring at the time. More perplexing was their confusion at the women's apparent retreat when the politics of Islam were invoked by other actors. Such reactions confirmed the urgency of my diagnosis that there is a crisis in understanding Islam and Muslim societies. In addition, when I was uh, doing the final revision of this new book in the late 2014, the tragic events of killing 
raping and enslaving women unfolded in the Middle East and other places in the name of Islam. Thus, it became more urgent to address the crisis in understanding Islam and these tragic events in a different discourse from the military intervention of Western governments who claim to establish democracy or to combat terrorism. Sad and enormous as these tragic events may be, imposing literal interpretations of Islam and misusing some Quranic verses and Hadith narratives to justify violence either by each side are not new. Rather, these misrepresentation, misrepresentation of Islam have been rooted in some fanatic Muslims' attitude and actions throughout the centuries. As more lies are being told today by both sides, the magnitude of the problem emanating from documenting in writing and canonizing the hadith centuries ago became strikingly crystallized, hence my call for completely different approach than globalizing democracy by force. For example, despite the fact that one third of the hadith narratives were on the authority of female companions of the prophet, very few of these female narratives at the time were involved in developing the premises that underlie the legal rules that generated to govern the society at the time. Worse yet, most jurists, the overwhelming majority were males, used these same narratives to develop harsher legal rules against women, such as allowing to give a young girl in marriage without her consent, or permitting a man to divorce his wife by texting her. By confusing the jurist rules with Quranic Sharia, as stated in chapter 45, verse 18, Muslims apply those rules as if they were divine. I must reiterate here that I'm neither discrediting the hadith nor refuting its central value and importance for Muslim thoughts and lives. Rather, I want to demystify the halo or the divine halo that's been casted over hadith for centuries that generated rules has caused injustices, especially to Muslim women for centuries. Muslims in general use hadith as a means to defend their biased interpretation of the Quran. Most troubling is the prevention of women's agency and leadership. By claiming that there was no precedent in hadith, they overlook the Quranic verses that shows equality in creation, as stated in chapter 4, verse 1, and equality in rights and responsibilities that are stated in chapter 33, verse, verse 35. When I synthesized and contrasted the content of some narratives with the Quran, I further uncover other injustice, injustice practices concerning gender. Hopefully, this synthesis will also educate the general Muslim population against the abuse of hadith, and it may facilitate Muslim women's participation in rereading and rethinking Islamic sources, as well as in shaping the global democracy movement of today. Muslim women's near absence in shaping and developing Islamic thought has basically deprived them of freedom of conscience. Hence, the pathetic conditions for the majority of the 900 million Muslim women require a change in perception attitude and on the ground by both Muslims and non-Muslims, as stated in chapter 13, verse 11. This is the crux of my new book. Now I should clarify the difference between Islam and Muslim and between Quran and Hadith. As you can see in your, the sheet that you have the definition before you. 
Then I will elaborate with some examples. Believing in Islam is the conscientious acceptance of its central principle, the one deity, as the source of value and knowledge, with justice being its goal. Without understanding the meaning of oneness of deity, or tawheed in Arabic, individual believer cannot practice Islam fully. Since such understanding requires an egalitarian interpretation of the text, only Quranic Sharia restores the religious or moral authority of interpretation to each individual Muslim. As the goal of Islam, justice also means that each individual is morally bound to act justly according to the guidance of the Quran even against oneself. Muslims, on the other hand, are individuals who proclaim to adhere to the guidance of Islam, yet they do not necessarily represent Islam in its totality. Believing in one deity and instituting justice requires deeper understanding of the Quran, void of the different interpretations and representations. Quran, as the primary and divine source, only divine source, is the only miracle of Islam. It was collected in a standard copy during the first decade following the death of the messenger Muhammad, who dictated uh, the revelations to a scribe as he was receiving those revelations. This standard copy is the only complete document representing the Quran for the past 14 centuries without any change. Unfortunately, the second and third century of Islam, during that time, Muslim jurists made the reported hadith as authoritative source of legislation. By doing so, they tended to ignore some of the Quranic central principles, particularly the emphasis on individual moral right and responsibility to understand the Quran in order to affect justice. In essence, those jurists regarded the Quran as if it is incomplete and in need of the elaboration and specification of the reported narratives. They also implied that a divine text needs to be completed and confirmed by specialized human interpretation, which is truly against the concept of one deity. Sadly, most Orientalists such as <coughs> use such views of the Quran as representing Islam in its totality. Thus, hadith became the second source that affect Muslims, the majority of whom tend to use these narratives more often than the Quran. Instead of considering them strategies to apply the Quran in time and space as the Prophet did, these canonized narratives became the foundations of orthodox patriarchy, and with the interference of outsiders, they were taken out of their historical context to justify fanatic and violent acts. For example, hadith was the first and most poignant instrument used to subdue the evidence that I and other Muslim women scholar activists were presenting from the Quran to support women's active agency and gender justice. Muslim apologists were presenting weak narrative to counter my quoted Quranic evidence that the headscarf for Muslim women and segregating the sexes were not required for Islamic modesty. They have done the same when Amina Wadud, the well-known American Muslim female scholar, led men and women in a congregational prayer in 2005. Such reactions drew more negative representations of Islam that were reflected in the demeaning images of Muslim women who, quote, cannot think for herself or cannot speak for herself or cannot defend herself, end of quote. To elaborate, 
the Quran in the Arabic language was documented in writing during its revelation to the messenger, Muhammad. Obviously, as a text, the Quran needed to be applied in time and space. Hence, the Prophet, as the community leader, developed his own reflections and strategies. Yet, he emphatically forbade his companions from quoting him and documenting in writing any of these reflections because, naturally, he did not want Muslims to use his reflections instead of the Quran. Since Quran authority is primarily a moral guide, it also requires individual free will to accept its word of view. Hence, free will becomes the first condition to understand the Quran in an intimate, direct relation to its content in order to, to be practiced fully. Yet, when early Muslim jurists also questioned women's legal standing as a witness to the message of the Quran and claimed that the value of women's legal witnessing was one half of that of a man, they implied something other than the Quran. They generalized from a specific Quranic verse that addressed conditions of witnessing a monetary loan to witnessing in general, even though all other verses related to witnesses were not gender specific. I, quest I analyze this issue in details in chapter two of the book. Therefore, each individual Muslim woman and man needs and should reread the Quran that which I called for in my 2004 book, and also they should rethink the hadith, that which I am calling for in this new book. That is because hadith is being misused as a primary source for applying the Quran, and its authority is elevated to the level of the divine source of Islam, the Quran. The only divine source is the Quran. Now to explain why we are facing major upheaval in most Muslim societies, I will address three questions. My main argument is that human right and human development and dignity of the Muslim woman will not progress in a meaningful and sustainable manner until the hadith is re-examined in a new approach from within the Islamic framework. These questions are three. First, is fanaticism limited to Muslims, and is it only a recent phenomenon? Second, what happened when fanaticism is not addressed? And third, why gendering is the worst interpretation of Islam? Although fanaticism is not limited to Muslims and has been with us for centuries, I am only focusing here on a few Muslim groups or individuals who constitute less than one-tenth of one percent. I repeat, less than one-tenth of one percent of the 1.7 billion Muslims. And those small groups who have more recently crossed the limits of Islam. That's the best way to describe them. The basic issue is that such fanaticism has not been addressed because the consequent actions have been mostly against women, so Muslims did not pay much attention to it. And mainly because Muslims are too sensitive or afraid to have a rational intra-faith discussion. They're concerned about interfaith, but they rarely do intra-faith discussion to understand their own religion well. I will ex explain this issue at the conclusion when I suggest some solutions how to change these attitudes. So fanaticism is not limited to Muslims, and it is not a recent phenomenon. Fanaticism and violence stem from ignorance of the fundamental of any creed, being religious or otherwise, combined with different actors, flaming emotions, and baseless beliefs, such as ignorance or such ignorance adds to the complexity of the problem among Muslims today because of various reasons. I will explain only two. 
First, the colonial power allowed the use of different interpretations of Islamic sources to be institutionalized and with the help of Muslim fundamental male scholars and orientalists, erroneously called such interpretations Sharia with a small s or Islamic law. This is very misleading because the human interpretations of the Quran cannot exhaust the possible meaning of verses and literal interpretations lead to oppression and sectarian tension. For example, the well-meaning European Western leaders who want to integrate Muslims in their respective societies were indirectly reinforcing the British colonial administration ruling in India when they allowed different religious groups in the subcontinent to make their customary practices the legal codes for their culture or religious groups. Similarly, the U.S. leaders allowed the Iraqi government to insert Muslim marja'iyya as a primary source in the 2005 constitution, bringing the women right back 50 years. Knowingly or not, Western leaders basically confused Quranic Sharia with the rules derived by jurists creating chaos in these societies, as well as further confusion in Western courts today. Because some conservative Muslims want to apply these unjust rules indiscriminately, including special modesty rules for women, as well as imported personal status codes. The second reason for not being the fanaticism not being addressed is that neither contemporary political politicians and leaders, nor orient <coughs> orientalist color, realize that sustainable change will not happen without governing societies being changing their attitudes and the personal status quo. Be it a democratic or theocratic government, the use of power will not help emancipate Muslim women nor enlighten the entire Muslim population against indoctrination. That leads to fanaticism. Military intervention never changed attitude. Hence, it will not change patriarchy and dictatorship, nor eliminate fanatic ideology. The challenge for the Muslim woman and her drive for autonomous authority, therefore, is to ask, what premises are being brought toward the process of democratization and rethinking Islamic sources, and how these premises are or not thereof, restructuring the mainstream jurisprudence process as well as the governing policies in Muslim-majority societies. Since one of the central problems within the current globalization of democracy movement is the near absence of Muslim women in shaping the Islamic thought, I'm afraid to say that there is no hope that Muslim women rereading the Quran and rethinking the Hadith will help in the short run because the problem is not with the Islamic text but with the perception of Islam and Muslim women. So what happens when fanaticism is not addressed? With the spread of Islam beyond Arabia, interpreters collected the orally reported narratives in writing about 200 years after the death of the Prophet. These written reports were made into canon of the Prophet tradition and later gathered into the literature of Hadith. In essence, Hadith became as authoritative as the Quran when Muslims became more rigid of using it before the Quran. Essentially, the ideal Islamic social structure was hardly realized in practice, mainly because Muslims still aspire to precedent history and familial or tribal affiliation. Hence, I also argue that the misuse and abuse of hadith is the main reason hampering Quranic gender justice in its broadest sense as well as the meaningful remote in practicing Islam. For example, the traditional and prevailing Muslims' emphasis on the dependent but segregated woman 
contradict the Quranic principle of Tawheed and its goal. Consequently, the three related principles, trusteeship, leadership, and equilibrated action were also misrepresented. What we have now is that oneness of deity as the central principle was transformed from meaning the unity of God and humanity into blind obedience and habitual worship. Justice as the goal of Islam was transformed into harsh rules to punish the contesting woman, as if contestation means fornication. Trusteeship or khilafa, being the human stewardship on earth, has been presented, preserved for the male political hires or caliphs, and the, as the only means to establish legal rules, the so-called sharia rules or sharia law with a small s, confusing it with Quranic sharia. Leadership in prayer or imama was confu confined to male leadership in general. An equilibrium in demeanor and action, or taqwa in Arabic, became a passive submission instead of the only criterion that differentiates individuals in their ability to balance autonomous agency with communal goal, according to Quranic guidance. Finally, women are still treated as minors like their children or sexually vulnerable and need protection. Hence, the majority of them are not considered trustee of themselves nor for their children, nor fit to witness the injustices committed in the name of Islam. Non-Muslims, meanwhile, and unfortunately, emphasize developing an emancipated Muslim woman who identify with cultural parameters other than her own. Without rereading the Quran and rethinking the Hadith, those tribal and fanatic attitudes and practices continue to cause many troubling consequences, such as complete marginalization of women. Women, unfortunately, were not involved in or participate in discussing the public sphere issues such as trusteeship, leadership, and legal wit witnessing. Worse yet, women rarely participated in discussing issues related to personal status code, such as marriage, divorce, and child custody, and inheritance. The other consequence is that the legal rulings that were generated, or the so-called Islamic laws concerning gender and women were most harsh and often contradicting other principles in the Quran, most pronounced is the issue of agency and leadership. How effective then would rereading the Quran, rethinking the Hadith under present circumstances? My answer is a Muslim woman, and a man for that matter, should do so because her identity has mostly been shaped by hadith as invoked mainly by men who may may not have deciphered the difference between the authority and the authenticity of the narratives. For example, although the Quran encouraged abolition and eventually prohibited slavery, the pre-Islamic norms of sexual enslavement of women affected the general attitude towards women as if they were a property of their male household or tribe. Such attitude resulted in interpretation that segregate free women in the name of protecting their owner or protecting them from enslavement. These norms are further misused to justify the fanatic and extremist group's horrible treatment of women, including the women who pledge alliance to their to fanatic interpretation of Islam. The last question. Why gendering is worse interpretation of Islam? Because Western leaders expect the gender justice and democratic governing of Muslim societies only to come through secularist Western perspectives. These leaders seem to forget that the present chaos comes mostly from the legal governance in these societies, which is a blend of what erroneously known as Sharia law, along with the legal system left behind by the same 
Western colonial government or power right now, as what happened in Iraq, for instance. Also, in Afghanistan, the reality for Muslim worldwide is that Islam and its value often cannot be divorced from all aspects of life, and hence Muslim women still live in Muslim-majority societies wherein the instrument of governing imposes other males' literal interpretations. Hence, I'm encouraging Muslim women to stand up for their rights, to affect change in understanding Islam, and to have the moral courage to demand a change in Muslim understanding of the Quran in its totality, and to rethink the hadith in time and space. These changes require the involvement of each woman to affirm her agency and authority to revise the operating premises on all aspects of leadership within Muslim societies. Each woman should retrieve Quranic Sharia instead of accepting the claims of gendering the so-called Islamic law. To conclude, how, we may, how may we change fanatic attitudes? To begin with, we need to realize that it is not possible to limit our interpretation and analysis or fanaticism analysis of gendering or fanaticism by using the same tools that were available to early exegesis, such as the way female jurists are being trained now. We are told that female are being included. They are training them with the same biased interpretations of the Quran. That's not the solution. Only by synthesizing the narratives attributed to the Prophet in parallel to Quranic verses that I was able to discern where the reported narratives and their consequent applications in most Muslim person status code and customary governing practices have contradicted the Quran. These findings do help to understand the gender injustices and how to eliminate or at least put a hold on these practices. I have five, four strategies. First, develop strategies to overcome Muslim resistance to rational discussion of their own faith without creating friction or ensuring the violence. The primary strategy is stop asking people and nations to be in our image the image of our Western society. We are not projecting the best image anyway. Second, rethink our Quranic guidelines and the hadith within the Islamic worldview. The critical action now is more than just a moral courage to rethink orthodox fundamental interpretations. Given what fanatic Muslim men and some women are doing now, especially with the innocent women of different groups, it becomes our duty to reject these interpretations and uncover how problematic they are, including those practiced in Muslim-majority societies. Because fanatics rely on these interpretations, we should also question the learned scholars of Islam or leaders in Muslim societies and communities' understanding of the message of the Quran as much as we are questioning the motives and strategies of the so-called experts on Islam or the Middle East and the political leaders who only think of military force as the solution. Third, we should apply massive and deeper education in the Quran, emphasizing time and space context and embracing multiple points of view and differences. A verse of the Quran must be read within the context of other verses surrounding it and in concert with the ideals and values articulated in the Quran as a whole. For instance, the Prophet designed special day for women to vote whether or not to accept or reject his spiritual and political leadership because free choice is fundamental to accepting the message of Islam. It is obvious that the Prophet wanted to emphasize women's moral autonomy and agency in casting their vote. As an individual woman, her primary identity with Islam and she, 
her primary identity is with Islam, and she only becomes legally bound by the guidance of Islam after ethically and consciously chooses its message in its totality. Yet, as far as we know from historical document, the Prophet did not ask the closest female companion to lead a congregational prayer while he was on his deathbed, even though there were a report that he had instructed learned women to lead in prayer men and women in their home. Perhaps he, was, he understood the patriarchal tribal attitude of the time but it does not mean that we should imitate such action now as most Muslims believe and do. Furthermore, and sadly, Muslims interpret the Prophet's designation of special day for women as if it meant segregating the two sexes. This misunderstanding contradicts the Quranic consistent direction that address both men and women with the goal of gender justice. Fourth and last, we should include all members of society in the education and decision-making process, especially the woman, to affirm her Quranic given right to learn, to know, and to think for herself and by herself. For example, the affirmation of khimar, the word khimar in Arabic means shawl or head cover, as stated in chapter 24. It does not mean it is a communal belonging or a ritual obligation. Rather, it is something that was practiced pre-Islam and was taken by the society at the time. Muslims, unfortunately, use two weak narratives to emphasize an extreme exclusion of women behind hijab or a screen. Even though the word hijab is used in a specific verse to address men, when they were speaking to the prophet's wives. Muslims unfortunately confused these two verses and called the woman's head cover hijab, which means a screen. That is wrong and misleading. More specifically, Quranic verses concerning the khimar is certainly part of overall guidance concerning modesty for both men and women. My concluding argument is that unless the Muslim woman realized this confused understanding of Islam and stand on women's rights and gender justice, she will not be able to change the perception of female as secondary dependent or owned property of the male household or tribe, nor will she be able to regain her given right in witnessing the Quran. That is because the West in general and Muslim male scholars and leaders have not effectively acted to stop the breach of human dignity and Quranic mandate when the political and civil crisis, especially in Syria and Iraq, were unfolded. Instead of only asking how to stop those fanatics through military intervention or the so-called counter-terrorist strategies, they should be asking what are the roots of such extremist behavior. Despite what appears to be a dark future, the struggle will continue, especially by Muslim women. I, for one, like other women scholar activists who identify with Islam, have struggled with some grassroots women groups to transform idealism into pragmatic local reform from within the Islamic framework. And I will continue the struggle as a witness to the spirit of the Quran as it clearly stands for gender justice as well as for a human dignity. And thank you for listening. Many thanks to Dr. Namat Hafiz Barazanji, author of Women's Identity, Rethinking the Hadith, for her comments. I'm Dr. Dina Ibrahim, your moderator for today. Now it's time for the question and answer period. We have a large number of questions, so let's begin. In your uh, recommendations, Dr. Barazanji, um, many questions that I have are about how those recommendations are actually being implemented in the region today. So I'm going to actually group together three very similar questions. 
Um, what Muslim country allows most rights to women? How are Syrian academics faring in Syria? And what is the significance of women voting in Saudi Arabia? Yes, it is on. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me stand. I feel better standing so I could face everyone. Thank you. Well, that's a very uh, critical question to say first how the implementation working in the region. There are many groups, what's called different grassroots groups, one of which uh, called uh, the Muslim Women uh, Learning uh, Council or the Musawa in Malaysia. Uh, Musawa means uh, equality. And other groups, uh, another group in Indonesia, a few other groups in Pakistan, they all starting to work with different Muslim women in reinterpreting the Quran and restating their own right. So that's one aspect of implementation. However, we still need more than that. We need a, a massive education for the populace because they are still teaching them whether it is in religious schools or in general, the whole social attitude is still very much dominated by those misinterpretations. And we need to tell them and be open and courageous to say that those misinterpretations have to stop being used because they are not taking the society anywhere, not only in just, are unjust for women, but they are creating further chaos in the society because everyone now is claimed that their interpretation is the one and making the other as an apostate and start thinking that the only way to convert them is by violence. We have to stop that. There is no one has the right to dictate an interpretation on somebody else. We need to rethink the whole process from the beginning and that's what I'm advocating. Now, in terms of uh, what countries more they were really it varies, whether you look at it socially or politically. Generally, they are the, what they call the Levantine countries or North African countries, uh, like Morocco, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, and uh, Libya, and Egypt especially. They are more open to understanding and giving the women more leeway in public space. However, still the underlying interpretations that dominate everything in their personal status code is the old interpretations that's done by males using, misusing some of the narratives of the Prophet Muhammad. And we need to rework all these personal status code and change them. How was the election in Saudi Arabia? Oh dear. <laughs> First of all, it's only a local you know, uh, thing, so it doesn't have a much political uh, imprint. However, I still also say, as others say, it's a one step in the right direction. But how can a woman nominate herself when she cannot drive? and go and make any uh, presentation of her views. So they, they are still, their thinking is very limited in that respect. Yes, we thank the late King Abdullah for opening this chance when he accepted the woman in the consultative uh, Shura Council. Shura means consultation. And there are some women already, few women there. But their role is very limited. Either they are told they cannot attend certain sessions or they're only limited when they're discussing specific women issues and so on and so forth. So w we should think positively but should not accept things in their face value. They are not what we want. We want to change the underlying premises by which these women are being trained, whether as jurists 
or as uh, in consensative shura or things like that. This is the main issue that I am discussing and uh, arguing for. Thank you. There are a few group of questions that are more specific towards the hadith text. An audience member asks, please give examples of hadith texts that have multiple or contrary interpretations. Well, very simple as I presented the example of the narratives about uh, the woman covering. They used two examples where the uh, prophet address a, a young lady who is uncovered, say, when a woman reach puberty, she should cover everything except her face and hands. Fine, maybe that was the circumstances at the time. And even if that narrative was authentic, the Quran does not talk about that. The khimar is head cover or shawl that used, were used by many people. You could see it everywhere before Islam. And it's used for environmental reasons but does not make it an obligation for modesty. Modesty is to be dressed in a modest form publicly where general body is covered, but the head is not a must cover. So that is a contradiction to the concept of khimar or the concept of modesty in the Quran. We'd like to remind our listening audiences that this is a Commonwealth Club program called Women's Identity. Rethinking the Hadith. Our speaker is Dr. Namath Hafiz Barazanji. Dr. Barazanji, this next question is, there must have been other reasons for challenging Hadith authority in addition to women's identity. Can you place your work and research within the context of other efforts to challenge Hadith-based authority? Oh, there are many contexts, but I'm zeroing on, on women's issues because this is the crux of the problem of why Hadith became authority or used as misused as an authority because women were not involved in developing Islamic thought. So that is the crux of the issue. If we don't address that, we cannot address any other things, whether it's political or social issues. So that's... that's my brief answer. Are there any verses in the Quran which you consider to be problematic for women's rights? No, unless they are misinterpreted. <laughs> well, the one about the witnessing that I mentioned as example, the one about the segregation of the sexes, the one about the n uh, not allowed to lead a prayer, co congregational prayer, the leadership, or leadership in general, political or social or whatever. So these are very important issues because they address the basic principles in Islam, as I said. They are the two central principles, which is the w oneness, the deity, and justice. But then they are the concomitant principles, that is trusteeship or khilafah in Arabic. The meaning of caliph, that is misunderstood as only political hire, it is not. Khilafah is a, a responsibility for each individual Muslim. Each individual Muslim is entrusted with the stewardship on earth, whether male or female, and that is very much misunderstood. Another thing is the creation story. The creation, the Quran creation story says, the Quran says, I am creating on earth a Khalifa. And that, and then at the same time says, I'm creating one soul from that soul, the feminine soul, I'm creating her mate. It was misinterpreted that the Proverb, I mean, the proposition was changed to be his mate, so that now Adam was made as the primary creature, and then the woman is created as part of him. It, it's misleading, is misinterpreting that specific verse in the Quran that says, uh, maybe I should read it so people will, will be able to understand it better this way. <coughs> 
Sorry. humans we created you of a single source and from it I created her mate so you live in, tr in tranquility now it was translated I'm saying it in English the Arabic translation was made the mate was made his rather than I mean the mate was made her instead of his and that's where they confuse the story of the creation. There is no distinction, gender distinction in the creation story. It's a one single soul, one single soul that both male and female count came out of together. So there is no first and second, no primary in the creation story and secondary in the creation story as it's been misinterpreted in Genesis as well. We know that. And uh, some of you who are familiar with the Bible would re understand that differences. Speaking of translations of the Quran, um, there's a question here that says, Un education comes from understanding source documents. Can you recommend a good annotated English language version of the Quran? Yes, the, the simplest and um, more accessible single is by uh, Muhammad Dawood. He, he closely tr translates the Quran uh, in a, a simple English language and uh, it's closer to being uh, more um, less gender bias, if I may say so. So that's what I recommend. Dawood. D A W D A W D or D A U D depends on. Unfortunately, we have time for one last question. In the San Francisco Bay Area, interfaith councils are very active, and Muslims, Jews, and Christians take part in many interfaith events. Is it different in Ithaca? You mean the interfaith dialogue? There are many groups who do different uh, interfaith dialogue, some mainly on the campus of Cornell University, which is the largest industry in Ithaca, New York. And then there are the local um, uh, different church groups that do that. So I don't know what happens here, so I cannot really say if they are much different. I've been informed that we can ask one more question, and so I shall. I'm actually going to go back to the question about Syria's intellectuals and perhaps get your, your take on um, how difficult it actually is for scholars and activists in the region to be reinterpreting uh, in, a, in a very highly contentious environment and where uh, religious conservatives uh, are quite dominant. So in fact, what you're suggesting, uh, while highly valued, uh, perhaps it is easier said than done. Well, actually, you m I must say that despite all the chaos, political chaos that's happening in Syria now, the most active scholars in reinterpreting the Quran are in Syria. And I should bring to your uh, attention an uh, article just recently came out from a person called Muhammad Habash. Unfortunately, it's in Arabic, which he talks about how old is this fanaticism that's happening here. And he shows the history of those fanatics in using and misusing the sources of Islam, particularly the Prophet. Um, 
attributed narratives. The other example is, and, and he was a member of parliament. Still being a member of parliament in Syria, he was able to speak up and discuss these issues openly without any problem. So if any of you is interested, the source is uh, Syria. Let's see. There. All for Syria, that's the website. It's called All, A-L-L, the number for Syria. That's the website, but it's in Arabic. I don't know if the, you may be able to translate it by Google, but I didn't try. Anyway, it's a very interesting article. It's dot, uh, .info. Dot .info. Um, there is another well-known uh, scholar, Muhammad Shahroor who is well-known Syrian scholars who also in 2009 wrote the most pivotal book about reinterpreting the Quran in a different way. He said, re again, he wrote something. There are women groups, but none of them yet came to write such prolific books. They wrote simple pamphlets, mainly for their or grassroots groups to educate the different women in their group and different families as well. So that's still being done, even into these days. And mainly, they start, they joined what's called uh, the revolution. Unfortunately, it turned not a real revolution anymore, but they joined it with the concept of a nonviolent revolution and rebel rebellion, a rebellion, but now it's it's a change when the foreigners, more foreigners, are fighting in Syria than the local people even. Now it's time to thank Dr. Namath Hafiz Barazanji for her presentation today. We also thank our audiences here, those listening to the recording, and on the internet. I'm Dr. Dina Ibrahim, moderator for today's program, Women's Identity, Rethinking the Hadith. Now, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating over 110 years of enlightened discussion, is adjourned.